All right, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Yusuf Munair. I'm a non-resident fellow at uh, Arab Center, Washington, DC, uh, and I am pleased to uh, welcome you to uh, ACW's fifth annual conference uh, and to this panel this morning, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict between uh, Trump uh, and Biden. And let me just thank also uh, Shibley for his um, uh, remarks, uh, which I think uh, provided us with some uh, really great context to carry on uh, with our conversation today. Uh, we have with us this morning four exceptional panelists who scarcely need uh, introducing. Uh, they will examine U.S. policy toward Palestine uh, and Israel and the impact of the 2020 election on future policy decisions. Uh, I'll introduce each of them uh, briefly um, uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, Peter Beinart is professor of journalism at uh, Newmark Graduate School of Journalism and professor of political science at the CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, Peter is also a contributor to The Atlantic, a columnist for Jewish Currents, uh, and a CNN political commentator. He's published books and has written for numerous U.S. and international periodicals. His most recent book, The Crisis of Zionism, was published by Times Books uh, in 2012. Laura Friedman is president of the Foundation uh, for Middle East Peace. Uh, prior to joining FMEP, uh, Laura served uh, in senior Middle East related positions, including uh, at Americans for Peace Now and at the State Department. Uh, she is an authority on US foreign policy in the Middle East and is regularly consulted uh, by the media and policymakers and their staff, uh, both in the United States and internationally. She's published widely in the press uh, and is a contributing writer at Jewish Currents and a non-resident fellow at the uh, U.S. Middle East Project. Zaha Hassan is a human rights lawyer and visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, her research uh, focus is on uh, Palestine-Israel peace, the use of international legal mechanisms by political movements, uh, and U.S. foreign policy in the region. Uh, previously, she uh, was the coordinator and senior legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team uh, during Palestine's bid for uh, UN membership. Uh, she regularly participates in track to peace efforts and is a contributor to The Hill and Haaretz, and her commentaries have appeared in The New York Times, Salon, Al Jazeera English, CNN, uh, and others. Uh, and Rashid Khalidi uh, is perhaps the foremost hist U.S. historian on the Middle East. He is the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University, uh, editor of the Journal for Palestine Studies, uh, and co-director of the Center for Palestine Studies. Uh, he's the recipient of numerous awards and author of almost a dozen books, including his most recent, The Hundred, Wars, Hundred Years' War on Palestine, a History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance, uh, 1917 to 2017. Uh, many, many thanks uh, to all four of you for joining us today. A uh, really stellar panel. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, before we jump into that, though, I would like to invite the audience to submit questions to the panel uh, using the Q&A uh, feature here uh, on, the, on the Zoom video call. Uh, or uh, via email by sending your email to events at arabcenterdc.org. Uh, please also join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtags, hashtag Arab Center 2020 and hashtag Forum Policy 2020. Uh, so I have asked each of our panelists to um, sort of provide us with some introductory uh, remarks on a couple different areas uh, of focus within this topic. Uh, and um, I'd like to begin uh, with uh, Rashid, if we could. Um, Rashid, you know, I'm hoping you can give us sort of a broad historical perspective on this moment and what it means uh, for uh, Palestinians. So uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to you. Uh, thanks, Yusuf, uh, and thanks to uh, the Arab Center for organizing this. It's very timely, and I'm glad you have so many people uh, attending. Um, I think that the moment that we're in during this presidential campaign um, is also a climactic moment in terms of the way the Palestine issue is treated in the United States. Um, 
I think we're seeing some really important seismic shifts. Uh, Shibri Tadhami's talk that we just all listened to, or most of us listened to, uh, talked about what I think are fundamental shifts in American public opinion that are ongoing and that I think will increase because I think they're linked to demographic trends and I think they're linked to uh, big changes among younger people. Um, at the same time, we're seeing uh, in the Middle East really quite striking events that the United States, I think, has precipitated to some extent. Um, I think that the process of normalization between unrepresentative dictatorial Arab regimes and Israel um, is, is an important phenomenon. And I think it probably will increase the fragility of those regimes over time. I think it will further isolate Israel in certain respects over time, but strategically, it's a big defeat for the Palestinians in many respects, I think. And this is partly a function of their failures uh, that this was mentioned in the last, in the last, in the last part of the panel, uh, the failure to put forward a peace plan, the fa failure to build up alliances, the failure to clearly state what the Palestinians want, the failure to have a clear strategy. But it's also a function of the weakness of most of these Arab, unrepresentative, undemocratic, repressive Arab regimes, which are the ones that are rushing towards normalization. Where there is any form of democracy or where public opinion has any element in governance in the Arab world, you do not see governments doing what the Emirates government or the Bahraini government uh, have done. Um, <clears throat> now, why do I say that we're, we're uh, some important changes are taking place? Um, I, think that, I think that the polling that, that Shibli uh, uh, Tadhami uh, just uh, exposed for us, that he did as recently as last month, um, is an indication that American public opinion, and I think with a great lag time eventually, American politics and with a further lag time, American policy, are actually going to begin to change. Uh, I think that one of the reasons for this is the most intransigent aggressive, expansionist, racist Israeli government in the history of Israel. And that's saying a lot. I mean, to, 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 to hit the top on all of those uh, metrics is, is remarkable. And that has alienated even many people who are very supportive of Israel. Um, and we saw that with the issue of annexation. Now, annexation, as it turns out, was a red herring. Annexation has been ongoing since the moment Israeli troops stepped into the occupied West Bank and Jerusalem. And it is an ongoing process. It will continue. And the brouhaha about it uh, was partially artificial. It was, it was, it was, uh, uh, to some extent, initiated by the Trump plan and, and Netanyahu's uh, reception of that plan. Um, but the changes I'm talking about, I think, are are really significant. In that, as as was mentioned in the last panel, we now have a group of Congress people, congressmen and congresswomen. There are going to be many, many more of them. Uh, as of the next Congress in January, uh, who are not afraid to be harshly critical of Israel, or at least of Israeli policies, uh, and who are much more supportive of Palestinian rights. Uh, this never happened in American history. There never was a bloc of, in Congress which said things like, Israel should stop imprisoning children, uh, or uh, we should make aid to Israel conditional on anything. That, no, the idea of conditionality never occurred. The only question was, how much more, how high should we jump? How much more, how high should we jump? It's now, there's a different debate going on. I agree that we're not going to have conditions on aid to Israel. We're very unlikely to have that. I agree that that block will not have much impact on, in the next Congress, but it's there and it is very important. Now, why are these changes taking place? I think that there is a real sea change among young people in this country where this issue is concerned. We just had a, a divestment uh, a referendum on the Columbia campus. The results were announced yesterday. New York City is where the Biltmore Declaration was announced in 1942. New York City is the city with the largest Jewish population on the planet. New York City is a city where you would assume if there is support for an intransigent Israeli position or for any Israeli position, you would find it to be very strong. In a divestment uh, uh, referendum at Columbia, the vote was 61% in favor of Columbia divesting from companies that support the occupation and 27% against. Over a thousand students voted for divestment at Columbia. The same kind of vote was seen at Brown, the same kind of vote last year, two years ago, the same kind of vote was seen at Barnard, which is a part of Columbia. So 
I think we are seeing something really quite remarkable, at least on American campuses, uh, among young people in the Jewish community, among young people from other communities. And the, 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 there's a fashionable term, intersectionality. Well, it, it actually has real meaning because the coalition that put together this divestment uh, platform included groups all across the campus of every color, stripe, race, background, uh, ethnicity, orientation, and so forth. Um, and that kind of thing is really, really important among young people. And I doubt that that's going to change for the worse as far as this issue is concerned. I think it's going to change for the better. And I think it's a function of the fact that a lot of these kids, a lot of these young people, are not, are not hooked on the mainstream corporate media. They get their news from other, other sources, all kinds of other sources, much more varied sources. And they know that much of what they're told in the mainstream media, which essentially repeats a narrative that is false and which we've been fed for generations, um, is unreliable. They know it's unreliable on other issues, and they know it's unreliable on this. Um, I think another thing that we should take into account is the fact that historically speaking, the Israel lobby has had a certain amount of power, but it's amplified that power by taking a few cases and saying, you see, if you oppose Israel on this issue, we will defeat you. Well, that's happened a few, in a few cases. Chuck Percy, you could go back and, and, and pick, cherry pick a couple of cases. It's not happening anymore. Uh, in the 16th congressional district here in New York, uh, the margin was, was enormous, uh, whereby uh, Jamal Bowman defeated Elliot Engel. Now, I don't think Palestine was the reason Engel was defeated. It was one of many, many reasons. But Jamal Bowman was explicitly favorable to a much more critical position on Israel. The same thing happened with Mondaire Jones in New York's 17th district, where uh, he defeated somebody who was very supportive of Israel. Um, the same thing happened in the Illinois 3rd Congressional District, where Marie Newman publicly said, I am in favor of conditionality as far as annexation is concerned. And she, she openly courted the Palestinian community in that district. It's a suburban district, southern part of Chicago and, and down into the suburbs. Um, so you're going to have three more. Those are only three of many more people who are going to enter Congress and whom the lobby tried to defeat or tried to help defeat and completely failed. So I think that the terror uh, which stalked the halls of Congress uh, when people were told, if you don't vote with is if you don't, sorry, if you don't take the, the paper that we gave you and do exactly what we say, say exactly what we say, or you'll be defeated, that terror has, has diminished, at least in the Democratic Party. Now, historically speaking, I think that we have a, 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 a situation that really hasn't changed. I think the United States has fundamentally opposed Palestinian sovereignty, statehood, independence, self-determination for many, many years, since 1978, the Camp David Accords. And I think that the fact that the United States is a dishonest broker is now apparent to a lot of people. I think the polls that uh, Shibley put forward, the, the polling that he put forward in the earlier segment uh, indicates that. I think that might have actually penetrated the thick skulls of some parts of the Palestinian leadership who um, have been uh, unwilling to accept that you have to go to a completely different uh, uh, approach. Uh, it's not enough by any means. But the idea of the United States as the essential actor it, it here is, is, I think, finally fading in the Arab world. It's an illusion that Anwar Sadat fostered, that many other Arab rulers fostered, that the rulers of the Gulf continue to foster. But I don't think they think the United States is an honest broker. I think they think the United States will protect their fragile thrones from their people and from other countries. That's, that's why, they, that's why uh, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain uh, normalized with Israel. They want Israel and, and the United States to protect them against their own people and against uh, challenges like Iran. Um, so I, I think that sooner, sooner than we might have expected, the United States uh, I don't think the United States is going to change course under Biden. It's going to continue to be pro-Israel. The leadership of the Democratic Party has not changed. The people in their 60s and 70s who uh, uh, lead the Democratic Party, control the money, uh, control the party machine, are as pro-Israel as they ever were. Uh, they'll, they'll shade that a little bit. That's not going to change. American policy will continue to be fundamentally anti-Palestinian. It will not support Palestinian rights. But the, 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 the gap between that and where the demography is going, where the youth are going, where the Democratic Party itself is going, where increasing number of people in Congress are going, is sooner or later, I think, going to have an effect. And I think that other, other people in the world, Palestinians, Arabs, others in the world, are going to realize that the United States has basically uh, uh, ruled itself out uh, as a mediator, ruled itself out as a constructive actor. 
Uh, I don't think that the policies of the Obama administration or the policies of what I expect the Biden administration, if he shouldn't be elected, uh, are going to are going to uh, change that. Uh, I, don't, I, I am not a person who says the United States is, is, is declining. That's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm saying the United States, by its blind one-sided policy under both Democratic and Republican administrations, has ruled itself out as, a, as, a, as the central player in any attempt to achieve a just solution to this problem. Uh, I, I don't think we will necessarily see one during the Biden administration, but I think we're seeing a trend historically, uh, which is positive, which is uh, uh, more and more Americans realize the United States has not been playing a constructive role. And let me stop there. Thank you so much uh, for uh, all of that, uh, Rashid. I want to um, I want to turn now to Laura, if we could. Uh, Laura is one of the most astute Congress watchers uh, on uh, Israel-Palestine uh, matters. Um, and Laura, I'd really love to hear your thoughts in particular on um, Congress in particular, uh, the sort of legislative initiatives on Israel-Palestine that have shaped the Trump period um, and what we, we might expect, um, you know, if we have a Trump victory or a Biden victory when it comes to um, legislation in Congress. And also um, something that uh, I know that you uh, think about a lot that uh, many people may not um, focus on very much is the impact of, of the, the legislation uh, that uh, has um, been passed during a Trump administration and the effect that that's still going to have moving forward regardless uh, to uh, who might win in November. So um, I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to Laura. Thanks, Yusuf. And uh, thanks for having this event today and for hosting this great panel. It's an honor to be part of this esteemed crew. Um, there's a lot to cover, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. And if people have questions, I guess we can get back to that in the q and I think thinking about Congress, the, the first thing I'd say is that if anyone, people who are present for Shibley's presentation um, that started us off today, um, if you look at Congress, what you see is that Congress is very much out of step with uh, what Shibley is finding in his polls about how American voters actually feel. Um, in terms of the traditional role of Congress and then looking at that compared to the Trump era, it, it's actually an interesting story because traditionally Congress, and this is bipartisan, um, has played a role. If you look back over the past 25 years or so, or since the peace process for sure, they've pretty much played the role of being the party that either pushes a White House, again, regardless of who, what party's in the White House, to be more pro-Israel, right? To move the embassy, to recognize the Golan, to punish the Palestinians for being bad, to clamp down on UNRWA, whatever. Or it's the party that condemns the White House for things that they're doing vis-a-vis -vis the peace process that they consider you know, not pro-Israel enough or problematic, like actions at the UN or, you know, again, failing to move the embassy or failing to sanction the Palestinians and the mission in Washington. So you, you look back at the history of peace process or Israel-Palestine focused legislation, that's the role Congress has always played because it's always been the White House that's been leading, whether you think they're doing it effectively or ineffectively. I think history would show it's always been pretty ineffective, but it's been Congress acting as a rein on the things that are trying to move the, the situation forward towards peace and trying to light a fire under a White House to be more, I would actually argue, anti-Palestinian and pro-Israel. Um, in With Trump, the, really the, the script was flipped from the get-go because Trump came in with an agenda that pretty much embraced every right, every far, I would call right wing, but it's bipartisan, everything Congress has ever been pushing an administration to do to the Palestinians, he did it on his own, right? So closing the PLO mission, uh, moving the embassy, recognizing the Golan, clamping down on aid to the Palestinians, reframing the relationship with UNRWA and, and, and essentially saying most Palestinian refugees aren't refugees. He did that on his own. To the extent that uh, Congress did act, I would point out, for instance, on Jerusalem or on, just on the PLO mission, um, you know, when the president refused, declined to give the waiver that allows the PLO mission to exist in Washington, um, he then let the PLO mission stay open for months and months in defiance of law. It's hard to imagine that a Congress would have permitted any other president to defy U.S. law and effectively let the president's 
against you, the Palestinians, against U.S. law remain in the U.S., but because Trump is seen, and this is, again, bipartisan patience for him as the true uh, pro-Israel you know, position or whatever, no one wants to challenge him on that. It was amazing as a, as a Congress watcher watching Congress stay silent as the PLO was allowed to stay in Washington all those months when law said they should have been thrown out because there was no waiver. The places where Congress really did set an agenda or go beyond Trump are also interesting. Um, a key piece of legislation that passed under Trump was the Taylor Force Act, which is the piece of law that pretty much says that all USA to the Palestinians has to stop because of the pay to slay, because Palestinians pay this funding to the, the, uh, to the families of people who've been killed or jailed by Israel. But let's remember Taylor Force was already on its way to passing before Trump came into office. It was bipartisan. So this was already there. This is not, a, this is not an artifact of the Trump era. Um, the two things that are more artifacts of the Trump era um, are the things that go beyond Trump policy, which are, you know, to get into really annoying language, ATCA and the URA Act. These are two pieces of legislation that are really designed to let the U.S., you know, to let private citizens sue the PA, PA the PLO, or other terrorist organizations, if you call them terrorist organizations, out of existence by private citizens. And the other piece of it is aid. And I know that Rashid just talked about this. The main thing that Congress did in this era, and this is again bipartisan with, with Republicans standing with Trump in his very pro-Israel position, and Democrats trying to prove they're even more pro-Israel than, than, than Republicans, is we have an aid bonanza over the past four years. And then aid bonanza really comes together in what is now being considered by Congress, which is the NDAA which may or may not be passed before the election. But this is a, a huge bill that it, it represents. I mean, it is a codification of the, the MOU, right? The, the Memorandum of Understanding to ensure that nobody ever puts any conditions on aid. And this has again got bipartisan support. It has new funding for programs across the board. It gives Israel a role at a cabinet level role in a, a role in cabinet level discussions on U.S. military planning. I mean, the 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 breadth of what is given to Israel in this bill is is, is breathtaking, um, and this is all happening in the context of Israel. Again, as people have said previously, very hardline government, government that is on the edge of formal annexation and moving ahead with de facto annexation. Um, so that's the that's sort of where it stands. Where, they, where things didn't happen under, this under Congress, where they didn't move, I think actually does speak to some of the dynamics in the grassroots, the broader political dynamics that are in play here. Um, there are three major pieces of legislation that didn't pass in this Congress. One is the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, um, the Israel Anti-Boycott Act, and the Combating BDS Act. And what these three acts have in common is that they're all brazenly supporting policies that are unconstitutional. Um, they're all about quashing free speech in the name of protecting Israel from criticism or in the name of fighting anti-Semitism, but they're all about quashing free speech critical of Israel. On the one of them, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, the president moved on his own and did this by executive order, so it's sort of overtaken by events. But on the other two, it really is interesting. These are pieces of legislation that APAC and others have been trying to get Congress to pass for years, and they hit a wall here with Democrats in the House, um, mainly, because not because I think leadership in the House is so progressive, but because this was understood it was going to be such an ugly fight already. That's before we had the primaries, which are going to bring in next year even more progressive members. We already had something of a break, at least on these worst pieces. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that moves uh, in the next round. So in that sense, I think the ground has actually already shifted a little bit. That is a break on maybe the worst things. People have also spoken about we are seeing for the first time um, some weak and limited support for conditioning aid to Israel or for at least having a conversation about conditioning aid to Israel, which was absolutely impossible in the past. And we're actually seeing some open and active criticism of a potential Israeli policy, although it does feel more like people are criticizing the word annexation more than they're criticizing the actual policy of annexation, which is not fabulous. But things are going to be changing in the next Congress. We're going to see some of the old guard departing, um, Engel lost, Lowy's retiring. I mean, that's a big deal and others. 
Um, the race to succeed angle as the chair of HVAC has been really interesting. Um, it started out, I think, a little more encouraging, but at, at this point we have one member, Sherman, who's running again as the more pro-Israel candidate. You should, you should bring me on because the other two aren't pro-Israel enough, but it's still a significant change. And then we have the victory of challengers at the grassroots who came in, not none of them. If you look at Jamal Bowman or Corey Bush, these are not um, primaries that were about Israel, but forces that want to ensure a status quo hardline position in the Democratic Party. They did enter these primaries and try to make it about Israel in order to defeat these progressive challengers, and they failed. And that sends a really powerful message, I think, to members of Congress. And, and I think it sends to the extent that there are progressives in Congress who until now have been perhaps reluctant to, to come out as progressive as they might be, um, there I think is some hope that the next election, that the next, the next house in particular, you will see more backbone because it's at this point, the Democrats, the progressive caucus is more of possibly the majority of the Democrats in the house. So it's going to be really interesting. The bottom line though is, whether I agree with Rashid, I don't think a Biden victory is going to change U.S. policy on Israel significantly. I think fundamentally it'll be an effort to roll it back to the highly successful, I say that with sarcasm, policy of the Obama administration. Um, but either Trump or Biden, I mean, I can't say with Trump whether he actually cares about what Congress does or rule of law, but if one does assume that we still have a separation of powers and legislative power, I think it is going to be a more interesting situation next year where you potentially have more progressives willing to hold the line, particularly on constitutional matters, because the Israel-Palestine issue is now being fought about on the Hill as a constitutional matter. Is it going to be made law in the US that it is anti-Semitic and therefore a violation of the Civil Rights Act, whatever, to criticize Israel? And is it going to be made a matter of law that a person as a personal matter choosing to boycott Israel settlement or settlements is engaged in illegal boycott or an anti-Semitism? So this is going to, I think, be where sort of the rubber hits the road when it comes to the grassroots meeting the political echelons. The last piece I'll just very quickly, and we can talk about it more later if people want, what Yusuf is referring to. There, there are folks who talk about Biden coming in and rolling a lot of stuff back. Most of the legislation people talk about rolling back is pre-Trump. And that's, I think, really important for folks who are, it's like my friends in Israel who wanna hold BB responsible for all the ills in Israel, which is convenient. Uh, Trump is not responsible for all the problems in US policy on Israel-Palestine. Um, to the extent that people want to see Biden roll things back, you know, reopening the PLO mission to Washington is going to be limited. It's limited by ATCA that did press, that did under this administration, but it's also limited by the Anti-Terror Act of 1987, right? That's, that's got to be dealt with. Um, the ability to restart aid to the Palestinians, that's the Taylor Force Act. Again, that, that's bipartisan. You, you have all the different pieces. There, there is going to be a tremendous challenge if Biden wins and wants to demonstrate a different face by rolling back policy, um, he's going to be challenged by the laws that are in place. And the last thing I will say here, if there's anything to take even a tiny bit of hope from, um, I would say that it is in the, uh, the Biden uh, campaign to, or the platform, which did at least give a nod to free speech, which is something that we hadn't seen before. And and for folks who watch this closely, that nod is about the things I'm talking about. It is about free speech critical of Israel. I'll stop there. Thanks so much for that, uh, uh, Laura. Um, I wanna turn uh, now to Zaha, um, who I know has been doing a lot of work and a lot of thinking about what the uh, potential uh, policy options and opportunities are for um, whoever comes uh, to be inaugurated on uh, uh, in January of next year um, and on Israel-Palestine policy. Um, so uh, Zah, I'd really love to hear from you about what we might expect in terms of policy from a Biden administration uh, or if we have another four years uh, of Trump, what, um, what more might uh, a Trump administration in the second term do on Israel-Palestine? Um, and critically, how might the Palestinian leadership react to these different uh, approaches? 
uh, in, the, in the next four years. Thanks, uh, Yusuf. <clears throat> Um, and thank you to the Arab Center for inviting me today to be among the, this really wonderful panel. Um, I'm going to apologize because I'm going to fidget a little bit because I just got this new stand-up desk <laughs> and I shouldn't have used it today, but I did. And so now I'm trying to get used to standing while working. Um, so anyway, I feel a little bit of uh, deja vu today because I think it was, in, yes, it was 2016 that I was sitting on a panel with um, Shibley and you uh, were moderating, Yusuf, and the subject was what to expect about a Donald Trump pre presidency or what we could expect from a President Hillary Clinton. Um, that felt like an important election back then, and we didn't know much about what a Donald Trump foreign policy would look like. Um, I don't think he did either. Um, but we do know a lot about, um, you know, uh, Trump today, and we have almost five decades of history with Joe Biden and government, so we are on a bit of firmer footing uh, to predict some things today. So what do I think? Um, first, I want to address the question of whether this is a big, if there is a big difference between Trump and Biden on foreign policy toward Palestine, Israel, and be because I think there is a sense um, for many of those who, uh, for whom, you know, U.S. foreign policy on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is an important issue, that there is little difference between one administration and another, and there is some truth to that, but um, we are in a very different place today, and I'll tell you why in a minute, and then after that, I'll address what exactly we can expect from a second term of a Trump administration and a first term Biden administration, and I'll flag some things I think we all should be watching out for. Um, on whether there is a difference between Trump and Biden on Israel-Palestine, I will shock some viewers by saying emphatically, absolutely. And that if you care about human rights and human dignity for all people in the region, then you need to understand that difference from what, you know, which is not so much one of policy, um, as Rashid said, but more on principles. Think about it like this. Uh, Palestinian freedom and rights is a scrawny but scrappy featherweight fighter that is used to fighting in a traditional boxing ring, which is the rules-based international order. It gets punched around a lot by the heavyweight champion of the world in that ring, which is the US, which is US policy, but it knows how to float like a butterfly and it can you know, rope a dope when it has to. Well, for the last three years, Palestine has been in the ring with an extreme fighter who was hiding a switchblade in his shorts. I mean, U.S. policy was hitting below the belt, kicking Palestine when it's uh, already down, and U.S. policy has not respected the bell to end the round, but instead took out the knife and used it mercilessly. Uh, you know, I believe a Biden administration will not be um, an, you know, an end of the match between U.S. policy and Palestinian freedom and rights, not at all. But um, it will be an entirely new match and one which, you know, Palestinians won't get hit below the belt, won't be kicked when they are down, and um, the U.S. will respect the rules of the ring. That's because the Biden team has made clear that U.S. foreign policy will center values, respect international legitimacy, and up uphold a rules-based um, order. And we should not underestimate the importance of that. Um, the situation has never been more precarious for Palestinians in this moment. And on top of you know, the challenges of living under occupation or the threat of displacement or as a stateless person in an Arab country hosting Palestinian refugees, there is a global you know, pandemic raging. And Palestinians need a reprieve from the last you know, four years. They need time to regroup their movement, rebuild their institutions, develop a strategy to deal with the changing geopolitical landscape. Um, they can see them through this moment. And um, they need to hear that bell at regular intervals so that they can rest and have the mind space to, to regroup. So what do I expect about um, a second term Trump? I mean, we can expect more of the same. I'm not gonna be really a novel here, but what, what do we know, what we do know about Trump policy is um, might makes right. And if you don't have something of value to trade with President Trump, one that benefits him personally or politically, then you don't matter. So gifts to Israel that help Trump rejuvenate support from his base, Palestinians have been the red meat. Um, but what could uh, possibly be left to give the base, even if that base really isn't asking for it, as Shibley noted in his keynote, um, as well, I think a second term Trump administration will likely continue to squeeze Palestinians financially. 
Um, the U.S. will, you know, influence third states to not give money to the PA as it has done with countries like Saudi Arabia that used to give the PA um, budgetary support, uh, $20 million a month. That hasn't happened since March. Um, I, you know, Trump administration will maintain the cut on UNRWA and encourage other countries to not um, contribute. And it will block appropriations that, you know, Congress may uh, make and put holds on appropriation. Um, and I think a Trump administration will be, you know, in the market for a new Palestinian leadership. It still wants to be able to say that, you know, its, it's plan, um, you know, was serious. And so it wants a, wants a Palestinian on the other side of, an, of the table. So it'll be looking out for that. And we're already seeing some congressional efforts to um, delegitimize PA or FETA officials and, you know, individuals, not, we're not talking about the organization, you know, coming into the U.S. because, um, you know, they are, you know, uh, according to Congress, supporters of, uh, or financiers, uh, or financial supporters of, of um, terrorism because of the support for families of uh, those who've been uh, victims of political violence or those in prison. So um, we'll also see Trump continue with the normalization with Israel and influence third states to do so. So you can expect to see more, you know, goodies put out there for countries um, like more arm, commercial arms sales and other, other things like with Sudan, um, removing it from the state sponsor of terrorism list, those kinds of things. You'll also see efforts to normalize settlements and, with things uh, and, and, and to integrate um, you know, settlements into the region through uh, economic uh, endeavors and projects, joint uh, projects that would involve, um, you know, Arab Gulf states, perhaps, and others um, uh, engaged in, in projects with, um, you know, settlement enterprises or settlers that are operating in the West Bank. You'll see, um, you know, BDS de delegitimization at home and, and abroad by equating it with you know, it and anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. There'll be more of an active effort internationally on that. Um, and, um, You'll also see an effort by the Trump uh, administration to link differentiation with um, BDS and try to discourage, um, you know, those who are interested in taking more serious measures around um, differentiation to, to think twice because they will be labeled with this anti-Semitism label. Um, on Jerusalem, I think you'll see a U.S. that will support Israeli efforts and provide political cover for the de-Palestinianization of the city. Uh, besides, you know, supporting Israel and or just, you know, providing political cover for things like home evictions and, and land confiscations, you'll see like support for these, you know, archaeological endeavors and um, and the, you know, eviction of Palestinian cultural um, um, entities from from the city. Um, now, now we go to the Biden um, administration or possible Biden administration. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but here's what the Biden campaign has been saying and laying out in various planks that they've um, put up, uh, you know, to the Jewish community, the Arab American community, and the, the Muslim American community, and, and also what campaign advisors and um, Biden himself has said publicly. I mean, for Palestinians, I agree with, with Shibley in his keynote, there will be no grand gestures or initiatives here. You'll continue to hear support and a commitment to the two-state solution, but I would point out that, you know, the reference is to a viable state of Palestine. Um, you know, viable state of Palestine, there's, you know, there's no reference to sovereignty or contig you know, contiguity that we've seen in the past. And there's this idea that there should be, you know, Palestinians, have, you know, uh, and Israel should have mutual recognition of their, um, uh, you know, as a predicate to this. And, you know, for, for Palestinians, that means recognizing Israel as a Jewish state and as a homeland of the Jewish people. And this is after we've had uh, in 2018 a quasi-constitutional um, law in Israel passed that says only Jews are entitled to self-determination anywhere where Israel extends its sovereignty. So, um, you know, and we've had the, you know, looming de jure annexation. So, but yet still Palestinians need to recognize a borderless Israel before they can, you know, just, you know, have negotiations, um, need to recognize Israel as a state, you know, for Jews and a national homeland for Jews. So, you know, that's still on the, you know, that's still on the table. Um, you're, you, we hear about uh, a Biden administration 
you know, opposing annexation and opposing settlement expansion, but we also have heard very clearly that there will be no conditioning of aid um, to prevent that. So we don't really know what that opposition would look like beyond, you know, public statements um, or maybe quiet urgings not to, not to annex, not to, not to extend uh, settlements. We've also heard about restoring economic um, assistance and humanitarian assistance. Laura's talked about some of the, you know, obstacles um, related to that. Um, and we've also heard about, you know, a, a focus on Gaza and the Gaza crisis. Um, does that mean, you know, there's going to be support for lifting the blockade? I don't think so. I think it'll be more of, you know, just trying to get more aid in and, and rebuild some infrastructure. Um, and we've also heard about um, reopening the U.S. consulate um, in East Jerusalem um, and reopening a PLO mission um, in Washington. Um, you know, Laura, again, has talked about there's legislative obstacles there as well. Um, you know, an executive, um, uh, and the, you know, the executive branch is separate from the legislative branch. There's things that a president could do um, under his executive or her executive authority um, there. But, you know, I just don't see that political capital being expended on, on, that, um, on that fight. Um, now for Israel, we've heard about, um, you, know, um, you know, opposition and rejection of BDS. But as Laura pointed out, there's this, you know, free speech guarantee that, you know, that um, there is going to be protection for free speech. But then what is what is that opposition and rejection of BDS going to look like? Um, we don't know. And how do you reconcile um, support for free speech while while condemning those who engage in it? So I don't you know, maybe that's all it is, uh, but we don't know much about that. And then we've heard about maintaining Israel's qualitative military edge. Um, this gets complicated now because of this um, this new vogue thing that's happened where, you know, if you normalize with Israel, you'll be offered um, weapon systems, which then means Israel needs to get better weapon systems because, you know, it's uh, it needs to keep its qualitative mi military edge. So, you know, are we going to go ahead and keep, um, you know, offering uh, this kind of incentive for Arab regimes with terrible human rights records um, and repressive tactics uh, internally to, to you know, encourage them to normalize uh, with Israel this way. This is actually one of the items on, uh, that the Biden has indicated he will continue to support, which is bold efforts to encourage Arab states to normalize with Israel. So that's something we need to pay attention to uh, moving forward is how is that going to, how is that going to work given the UAE precedent at this point? Um, you know, and what's it going to mean for human rights in the, in the region and a foreign policy that is value-based, and that's what the Biden campaign has talked about. And then there's also this uh, promise to protect Israel and international fora and to re-engage in an in international mechanism that the U.S. has withdrawn from for the purpose of protecting Israel. So how do you square that with this platform that is looking to restore you know, international legitimacy and restore a rules-based order if you're going to use your power and influence in those mechanisms to prevent the application of law. So there's a lot of you know, things that need to be, that remain to be seen about the policy and how do you reconcile a lot of these things. So quickly, what will Palestinians do? Well, if past is prologue, then the national movement is in trouble because Palestinian leadership has been paralyzed by disunity and consumed by its own self-preservation. The Gaza, Hamas, and Fatah West Bank split has prevented a serious conversation to move forward on the Palestinian political program. But there are some hopeful signs, however, and um, that things might be changing in this regard. Um, there's been a you know, unified leadership dialogue that, that has begun. Um, Hamas and Fatah came to an agreement in Istanbul on elections. The Palestinian president has agreed to change the election laws so that Hamas candidates in PA elections don't have to swear, you know, a commitment to the PLO before, um, you know, running. That law was put in place by decree after Hamas won the 2006 elections, and it's prevented an agreement between Hamas and Fatah on holding elections. Um, but now, he, you know, the, Abbas has indicated he's, you know, he's willing to uh, reverse that. Um, but then there's a sticking point of holding elections in Jerusalem, which, you know, 
um, President Abbas has said in the past that that is absolutely necessary. Um, so we'll see how that works out. I mean, you know, Israel does not want to see a unity, you know, unity um, between Fatah and Hamas. That would impede its separation policy with respect to, to Gaza. Um, so, and the urgency of Hamas towards reconciliation is not as strong today as it had been in the past because Israel's been allowing Qatar to bring in financial support um, into the Strip. So, it, you know, this, this is all very contingent and we just don't know what's going to happen there. I mean, what should Palestinians be focusing on? I mean, I personally don't think elections is the priority, it, particularly not PA elections right now. It doesn't make sense since the, the PA itself needs to be rethought, you know, and also the elections will get bogged down in all of these details and there will be fights and battles between Hamas and Fatah. There's some, you know, ideas about how to resolve those battles, like creating a joint list between Fatah and Hamas, but, you know, it's just going to be a really long struggle. I think the focus should be on institutionalizing the unified leadership dialogue and continuing with that mechanism to resolve issues and start having conversations about, you know, what exactly um, should be uh, Palestinian priorities, how to get to, um, you know, uh, understanding about where the political platform should go. Um, and, you know, reconsider the two-state solution, under, you know, and figure out how to deal with annexation, um, you know, whether to withdraw now from past ag agreements that recognized Israel. Um, if there is no purpose behind the PA, um, what is its purpose? and how to respond to the geopolitical changes and the normalization that's taking place around. I mean, there's so much to talk about, including the COVID-19 response measures. So to me, that's much more of a priority than talking about PA elections when you don't even know if PA has got any you know, purpose at this point. So that in a nutshell is, uh, is what I have to offer. Thank you for all that, uh, Zaha. I wanna uh, now, um turn it over uh, to Peter. Peter, I know uh, that uh, one of the, the topics that uh, you write and think about a lot is the um, American Jewish community and sort of uh, where they are uh, on this issue. Um, you know, obviously the, uh, the, the last four years, the, the Trump years uh, have uh, been quite a, a moment for the American Jewish community, one where we've seen you know, this uh, remarkable rise in, um, in anti-Semitism uh, and at the same time, um, uh, quite a profound embrace between um, the president of the United States uh, who is um, fomenting a lot of this, uh, you know, anti-Semitic uh, attitudes um, uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, being validated by the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Israel as the greatest friend of the Jewish people. Um, so I, I'm wondering sort of uh, from, from you, what sort of shifts you've seen in the American Jewish community over uh, this time, how it's sort of uh, evolving, what, what shifts you think are important and um, you know, what, what impact uh, an election uh, outcome in either direction will have on on those uh, shifts that we've seen in recent years. Thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with such a, a wonderful group of people who I admire um, so much, these um, fellow panelists. I, I think that the, the macro story, I think, in the American, uh, among American Jews, um, I would just parenthetically say that uh, um, even the terminology is, 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 is very problematic. The, the, the macro story is a story of a collapse of a center and polarization. And one of the ways you could understand that is actually terminologically, which is that there's a split between American Jews and Jewish Americans, which is to say, um, is, is America the, the, um, the adjective that defines the noun of being Jewish, right? And, uh, or is, is Jewish the adjective that defines the noun of being American? That's kind of one way of thinking about two completely different perspectives uh, that exist in terms of what it means to be Jewish in the United States. One way of understanding, I think, that this kind of collapse is, is to think about what the center is. And if you think about the people who have historically populated APAC, they are people who are um, fairly secular, but highly affiliated. I call them in my book, secular tribalists. They're not religiously observant Jews, but they're people who's in a way have substituted a form of Jewish nationalism 
for traditional religious observance. They generally belong to conservative or reform, but not orthodox synagogues. And they're generally moderate Democrats who have not radically left, but moderately progressive views on domestic policy, and yet kind of code switch put on a different set of lens when it comes to Israel-Palestine. And basically, in, on Israel-Palestine, instead of being progressive, they are kind of security-oriented and nationalistic. Now, this center is clearly in decline. One of the reasons, and, it, but, and, it, and so what you see is growth on both the left and the right, right? It's easier for us, it's more favorable to us to think about only the growth on the, to the left of this, but there's also a lot of growth to the right of this. Why is this center collapsing and why do we see growth on both its left and right? The first is religious change. There's a strong correlation between people's religious commitments and their political affiliations among Jews, just as there are among many other Americans, particularly white Americans, right? We know that white Protestants and Catholics who go to church more are more likely to be Republican. Those who go to church less are less likely to be, uh, more likely to be Democrats. Not that different with Jews. The, the Jewish center has been essentially people who are affiliated with conservative and reform synagogues. Those numbers are in steep decline. The conservative movement, which was the center religiously and culturally of American Jewish life in the middle of the 20th century, is in free fall. What you see is growth among non-affiliated Jews, right, who have no, affiliated with no religious group, and you see dramatic growth in the Orthodox community. Right. And you see essentially, so you've got one group that is highly universalistic um, and one group that is highly tribal. Um, and so as the religious center collapses, it's not surprising that the political center, which is, again, as I say, kind of moderate Democrats who uh, who support groups like APAC, who talk about the believing in the two state solution, but wouldn't ever do anything to actually support it. Uh, that that center is, is collapsing. The other reason the center is collapsing is because of generational change. It's not a secret that across a wide array of issues in the United States, there are massive generational divides. And this is true among American Jews as well. Um, um, but it's important to have, to, th there's an important caveat here. We talk about how younger American Jews are more progressive on Israel as on it, virtually everything else than their parents and grandparents. Absolutely true. It's also important to remember though, that Orthodox Jews are a significantly higher percentage of millennial and Gen Z Jews than they are of Jews who are in their 50s or 60s or 70s and 80s, right? You have Orthodox Jews get married earlier, they have more kids, they affiliate as Jews uh, in, in much stronger numbers, their intermarriage rates are much lower, right? So even so Orthodox Jews in the younger generation, even though they're a minority, punch way above their weight. And so if you go to an APAC meeting, one of the things you notice, it's worth going to an APAC meeting and just looking for the, at, at which of the, what percent, which of the men are, are, are wearing kippot, right? Uh, or yarmulkes, right? What you see is that of the men over the age of 50, it's a fairly small minority. Of the men under the age of, let's say, 40 or certainly 30, it's probably a majority. Right? So what is essentially happening in the organized American Jewish community, certainly a group like APAC, is the secular tribalists, their children may not be interested because their children may be secular universalists who are either more progressive on Israel-Palestine or frankly just don't care very much because they're not really that, uh, that connected to Israel-Palestine or frankly to that much Jewish at all. But they do have another generation that can replace their children. And that generation is coming out of the Orthodox community. Just go, you know, if you go to an Orthodox day school anywhere in the United States, or even a, a pluralistic day school like the one my kids attend, you walk in and you see a clock, which has the time in the city that you're living in, and it has the time in Jerusalem, right? That these are kids who are going to spend a year in yeshiva after they graduate. This is a highly, highly Zionistic environment. You go to look at the, the Israel Day Parade in New York City. It's entirely dominated by the Orthodox community and by vast numbers of kids from Orthodox Jewish day schools. Um, so that's the future. And that future is further right than where APAC is, partly because the Orthodox community is very ensconced in the Republican Party, right? If you're a Jew who's not Orthodox, you're likely to live in a community where people think that to be Republican means you're not really maybe very a very good Jew, 
right? If you're in the Orthodox community, you may very well live in a community where you think to be a Democrat means you're not a very good Jew. It is a completely bifurcated partisan notion. And, and so, you know, someone like Jared Kushner, right? He, there are many, 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 many Jared Kushners coming. Right, given his particular constellation of religious and political affiliations, that is not going away. There's going to be a lot of that. Um, uh, the in general, I think you can say that there's a roughly 50-50 split on the question of basically, not on, uh, on. If you ask the question, basically, you know, if, if the question is, do you really care about Palestinian rights at all? Do you want the United States to be more supportive of Palestinian rights than it is now? Um, you probably have a roughly 50-50 split among American Jews on that question, if you want to say kind of the J Street position versus the APAC position. And of course, there are some people to the, to the, to the left even of, of, of J Street. The, the problem is that those, that, as we know in America, numbers do not determine political power. There, there are a lot of other factors that determine political power. Older people have more political power than younger people. People with money have more political power then look how much power Sheldon Adelson has, right? You can give me, you know, you give me 50,000 young lefty Jewish kids, right? They probably don't have as much power as one Sheldon Adelson does. This isn't only true among Jews. Look at Cubans, right? You see that the, the more conservative element of the Cuban American community, which is the older generation, is still politically overrepresented. It's partly because of money. It's also because it's more institutionalized. If you're a member of a synagogue or a member of some kind of Jewish organization, you have an institution from which to play politics and to get to know your member of Congress and to start to give money and to have all those networks. Yes, that exists with J Street. It even exists a little bit with Jewish Voices for Peace. But generally, the more conservative Jews are, are much more institutionalized in the Jewish community. And therefore, it gives them a greater avenue to have access and connection with, with politicians. There's also this, this kind of weird irony, which is to say, the divide is basically between tribalists and universalists, essentially, right? And in essentially, it's not surprising because Judaism itself is all about the tension between, between universalism and tribalism. But the irony is the very universalism that makes younger, more left uh, uh, Jewish Americans care about Palestinians, see them as human beings who deserve rights, also makes them care less about the whole issue. Because if you are, the more universalistic you get, if you sit in Westchester or California, the more you're likely to say, yeah, maybe what Israel's doing is pretty bad, but goodness, my moral universal commitments are so spread out given what's happening in the world today. Climate change, right? If I go to speak at a college campus to young non-Orthodox Jewish college students, the biggest challenge for me is not to convince them not to be, to be against what Benjamin Netanyahu is doing. It's to convince them to care about this issue rather than climate change. I think it's different among often among Palestinian Americans for whom their own family story is so deeply intertwined with this, what their parents went through, when their grandparents went through. But for Jews who've been in the United States for 100 years, for whom Israel is a pretty abstract question, oftentimes they just disassociate because their very universalism leads them not to prioritize this issue over anything else. And of course, particularly at a time when the United States and its democracy are in such peril, it's obviously easier for them to naturally focus on things here. So in an ironic kind of way, the young American, the young Jewish Americans who are most engaged and who, in whom I have the most hope to change this debate are not the most universalistic ones. They tend to be the ones who come from more strongly affiliated Jewish backgrounds, whether because they went to Jewish day school or Jewish day camp or, or something. And yet then they have some experience, often a personal experience with Palestinians that essentially allows them to try to fuse universalism, tribalism in a way in which they say the honor of that, that I feel as a Jew, some sense of shame or guilt or moral responsibility or my honor is at stake. If you don't have that sense of that you are part of the Jewish story in a funny way, it actually makes you less willing to engage and fight for, for Palestinian rights. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll stop there and uh, you know, I'm just happy to talk about whatever folks wanna talk about. Thank you for, for that, Peter. It was really fascinating. Um, I want to, um, we're going we're gonna to move now to a couple uh, questions that I have for uh, each of you, and then we'll open it up um, uh, for questions from uh, the uh, audience online. And just to uh, remind you all, if, if you want to uh, send in your questions, if you have not already, 
Uh, you can do that through the Q&A feature here uh, in, the, in the Zoom uh, program or uh, by sending them via email to events at arabcenterdc.org. Uh, so get them in the queue if you've not uh, uh, done so already. Um, Peter, I, I want to stick with you um, and, and get you to talk about this uh, bit a little bit more. Um, you wrote in, in your piece in, in Jewish Currents earlier this year. Uh, you made a argument uh, for moving in a different direction toward a single state uh, with equal rights for Israel and Palestine. Um, this piece was published right after uh, the sort of anticipated official Israeli annexation announcement that never materialized. Um, instead, what we've seen in recent months is these uh, normalization agreements, uh, including one with the UAE, uh, which they sought to frame a sort of an effort to stave off uh, annexation. How much do you think these dynamics will impact the, the traction of, of your argument uh, with uh, an American Jewish audience? I think ultimately not really that much. I, I mean, I think that um, if you look at um, I think what, 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 what people, you know, what the mainstream kind of establishment Jewish discourse is, well, now we know that nobody cares about the Palestinians, right? Not even the Arab governments care about the Palestinians. So the Palestinians essentially should accept whatever they're given, right? That's the basically, that's the underlying notion, right? Whatever crumbs they're given, they need to accept. Um, and I think the, um, uh, the implication is, I think there's also an unstated assumption that essentially Israel can do whatever it wants to the Palestinians with less, with even more impunity than it's had before. Um, so I think those are kind of, those are kind of underlying kind of notions. Um, but the reality is that um, um, it's not the Gulf monarchies that have the ability to um, speak to people around the world, including Americans, including younger Jewish Americans, and, and, and galvanize them around a moral vision, right? I mean, goodness knows, those are the last people on earth who could do that, right? The people who can do that are Palestinians who speak you know, in the long tradition of peoples who have been denied basic rights and speak in the language of justice um, and the language of love, you know, and again, I mean, if you look at the, at, at, at the reception, at, at, you know, you put I'm an Oda in front of Jewish audiences, even remotely progressive audiences, and you see the power of a Palestinian vision of equality to speak to, um, to, to Americans, including uh, at least a big cross set of a lot of younger American Jews, I think you see the possibility of that. And so um, I, I think that this, um, when, um, when that, it, to the degree that that emerges, I think that that will capture the imagination of people. And, and, and ultimately, in the end of the day, that we, will, we could get to a situation where you have a kind of, yes, congratulations, you now have a kind of Jewish, Arab kind of coalition for, for authoritarianism, you know, uh, and for tyranny. Congratulations, very ecumenical of you. Um, you know, what we need on the other side is a Jewish, Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, go on and on and on, coalition of people who believe in justice and equality. And I don't, I think in some ways that would be a nice argument to have. Thanks, uh, Peter, for that. Uh, Rashid, I want to sort of turn to you with this next question, continuing on this theme of responding to um, the, the normalization announcements that we've seen in, in, in recent weeks. Um, there was a, uh, an article in The Economist uh, recently that argued, uh, as it was titled, uh, that the Arab-Israeli conflict is fading. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, you know, as, as a historian who has uh, written and documented uh, this conflict for, uh, for so many years, how you react to the idea that the Arab-Israeli conflict is ending. Let me, let me just add something to what Peter said. That coalition has to also talk about democracy. 
be if not just justice and equality. Those are the key things, but it, it has to talk about democracy. The most absolute monarchies on earth are the ones that just made agreements with Israel, one of which was installed by Saudi troops after its people almost overthrew it in Bahrain uh, or reinstalled. Um, and that is a requirement. I mean, that, when the PLO actually had some purchase in the Arab world, it was aligned with progressive forces or what were then appeared in the 60s to be progressive forces, forces that were in favor of justice and equality and, and democracy. And that has to be the, the, the approach going forward. Um, you're obliged to deal with governments, you deal with them, but you go over their heads to their peoples. And there is a huge thirst for democracy in the Arab world, not just 2011, 2012, uh, but what has happened up until COVID shut it down in Algeria, in Sudan, in Iraq, in Lebanon, uh, shows that that's the case. And you have to align yourself with those forces on a Jewish, Arab, Palestinian, whatever basis. But to speak to, to, speak to uh, the, the question you asked me, Yusuf, um, in certain respects, the Arab-Israeli conflict as a state-to-state -state conflict has been over since Egypt and Jordan signed peace treaties. There remains uh, the issue of the Golan Heights. There is an Arab-Israeli, i.e. a state-to-state -state conflict over the status of the Golan Heights. Uh, leaving aside Lebanon and, and the Sheba farms, uh, which I, I, we could talk about. The issue is between Palestinians and Israelis over the status of Palestine. That's the conflict. And in fact, the Fahad plan of 2002 more or less accepts that. It says, we're ready to make peace with you. Just deal with the Palestinians and we're done. The, the Arab states basically said, we have no conflict with you. Even Syria signed on to that. Obviously, they wanted to go on heights back and do and have the right to have it back. But aside from that issue, there is no state-to-state Arab-Israeli conflict. Egypt and Israel have a border that has been adjudicated by peace treaty. So do Jordan and Israel. Uh, the Lebanese border with the exception of Shabbat farms, is not really the issue, an issue. So besides Syria, the question is, what is the status of the Palestinian people? What is the status of Palestine? What is the status of Israel or Israelis? And in, 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 in that's the conflict. It's gone back, as I argue in my book, to its settler colonial roots, the state-to-state -state aspect that came in in 1948, more or less has been ended. So I, I am not, you know, I'm not, I'm not somebody who says, no, uh, the, this, is, this is still a core issue for Arabs. It's not a core issue for Arab states. Now, Israel's intervention in the Arab world is something that I think people should be very deeply concerned about. The kind of alliances it makes with the worst regimes on earth in terms of repression of their own people, in terms of completely, ex completely operating on a basis opposite the consent of the government. That should be a matter of concern. The fact that you have these kinds of alliances and you, the fact that Israel is directly involving itself in all kinds of, that's a, that should be a matter of concern on a state to state basis. But that, that's, that's not the core of the conflict. Uh, there are issues with Turkey, there are issues with, with Iran. The big nation states in the Middle East are pushing other people around and the Arab states are a mess. That's another issue. Um, uh, and Israel is a big, big problem in that regard. But the real issue is the institutional discrimination that, that Israel represents insofar as the Palestinians are concerned. It represents the denial of Palestinian rights, not just self-determination, almost any rights. They have no, no political rights. You don't have the right to your property if you're Palestinian, okay? If you had property in Poland and it was stolen from you by the Nazis, you have a right to it. If you're a Palestinian and it was stolen from you, and I, you do not have that right. If you were forced to leave your home uh, in 1948 or your grandfather or your grandmother was, you don't have the right to return. So those issues of rights, those are, that's the conflict. That's where the conflict is. How it's adjudicated is another matter. And the fact that Arab public opinion is actually rather supportive of the Palestinians on this. The Arab Center has done wonderful polling on this. And it's shown consistently over the years that in the 12 countries that were polled or 11 countries that were, po that were, were polling took place, including some of the Gulf countries, public opinion in the Arab world hasn't changed one bit. It's very resentful of the idea of normalization with Israel, as long as Israel continues to treat the Palestinians in the awful way that it does treat them. What has changed is that Arab governments, undemocratic, repressive, afraid of their own people, uh, kleptocracies that steal the wealth of their, of their societies uh, and are protected by uh, the, the, the Western countries that are benefiting from that wealth, um, are willing to deal with Israel because Israel will protect them as well, just as the United States has protected these, these kinds of regimes. So is Israel perfectly willing to step in uh, and do that. Um, and that's why the opposition should be on the basis, not just of rights and equality, but also of democracy. Thanks very much, uh, Rashid Zaha. I, 
I know that in your comments, you sort of minimize the uh, uh, importance of, um, you know, elections for uh, Palestinians, at least PA elections as uh, being super important in, in the immediate short term. But, you know, I, I, I have to ask you, you know, this November, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the uh, president of, of the PA, turns 85 years old. Um, this summer, there was something of a rare conference that brought together Palestinian factions um, from both uh, Ramallah and Beirut as normalization announcements started to take place. Uh, there's renewed talk of elections now for uh, the PLC, the presidency, and more. We've heard all this before. Uh, is the Arab normalization announcements a reason to take the election talk among Palestinians more seriously? this time? Um, and how do you think the shifts in, you know, Arab positions impact uh, Palestinian domestic politics at all? Yeah, I think it's definitely more serious this time, but I don't think the complicating factors have changed um, at all. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really um, so hopeful about the PA elections. And like I said, I just, you know, at a time when, you know, the Palestine uh, Central Council has, you know, for many years now, called for, um, you know, the derecognition of Israel and the termination of the Oslo agreements, um, and to rethink uh, the PA. And and this is also very widely supported by Palestinians. Um, why why start with? Legislative elections to to this body when it didn't end so well last time anyway <laughs> for for Palestinian democracy. Um, so you know, yes, um, re revitalizing the PLO should be um, the priority. And the, but how to get there? You know, the the PLO um, process of uh, you know electing people is it's not elections anyway. It's a quota system that's very antiquated. And to talk about going straight to, um, you know, PNC elections, the the you know Parliament of the PLO, is also uh, problematic because, you know, if you look at you know who's uh, how they did the PNC um, you know uh, elections last time, uh, just a few years ago, a couple of years ago now, you know there was very you know people were were not happy with how it how it went down because. It wasn't very transparent. You know, no one really understood who was, you know, how the quota was was being worked out and why certain, you know, factions that are really um, non-existent, there might be a few people left, you know, on some of these factions or some of these bodies were still, um, you know, still having uh, this kind of representation in the PNC. So the idea really should be to focus on sitting down and having, you know, a conversation uh, between the, the you know Hamas and Fatah and, and the other factions, and civil society as well should be brought in to talk about you know how do we um, you know how do we really have a representative PLO? What should it look like you know in 2020? You know we're not in you know you know 19 um, you know 65 anymore. So let's let's talk about what that should look like. Um, and that's not where the focus is right now, and th and that's concerning to me because. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't bode well for the way this is all going to end um, if the focus starts with with uh, legislative elections, and, and in particular because we know um, what uh, you know the Palestinian leadership has said about holding elections in, in Jerusalem, and you know that you're not going to get uh, an Israeli government that's going to be willing to to um, you know comply with past modalities for um, elections in Jerusalem there would have to be some compromise on that and and um, so we'll you know we, it just remains to be seen in terms of like you know the leadership and, and where is that going uh, you know that's it's um, it's hard to say really um, it's going to be some, it's going to be a feta uh, nomination process and you know there will be a transfer of authority but it will be folk you know it will be you know internal to FETA the central council or central committee and um you know it's similar to what happened when um Yasser Arafat passed away so um you know there's there's a lot of work to do um inside uh, Palestinian internally um and in 
with respect to the PLO, uh, as I said, I just don't see, I don't see the PA as being quite the priority now. Thank you, Zaha. Uh, Laura, last question for you here before we turn to the, the questions from the audience. Um, you know, one of the interesting sort of dynamics that we saw after the 2016 election is that the uh, election of uh, Donald Trump uh, provided a, a, a much clearer contrast, right? Uh, particularly uh, for, um, you know, those who may have been uh, on the fence on this issue, and it sort of allowed for more space, particularly among progressives in Congress, to start taking uh, more steps towards um, legislative uh, action of, of one form or another. Um, what sort of impact do you think a, you know, a Biden election, let's say, uh, a Biden win in the election, um, might have on Congress and the space there um, to continue doing this type of work, particularly if the Biden approach is one that says, you know, we're, we are going to sort of repair the relationship between Israel and Democrats that has been so fraught uh, in recent years. Thanks, Yusuf. It's, it's interesting framing. Um, look, candidly, I think if there's going to be a shift in Congress, the bigger shift is going to come from a change in the composition of Congress and members who are elected directly, uh, who are responsible to their constituents and who are coming to Congress either recently elected with a clear statement um, from their grassroots as part of their election about where they have room to maneuver, maneuver on Israel-Palestine and are more progressive and how much of a sort of shot in the arm they give to fellow progressives in Congress who maybe haven't tested this the same way with their grassroots, but are more progressive and, and want to move there. And I will say as someone who's, you know, worked, you know, wandered the halls of Congress for, for many a year, um, it, you know, for decades, you walk into somebody's office, you close the door and the member of Congress says to you, I want to be more progressive. I'm really frustrated about Israel. I support the Palestinians on this. This is terrible. I'm not anti-Israel, but I can't support this. They say, but I can't say that publicly or I'll get just destroyed. It would be interesting to see in a new, particularly a house, um, how that shifts. How much could be impacted by a Biden presidency if, say, a Biden presidency, and, and by the way, it's not just the Biden presidency, it depends what happens in Israel, right? Because if you continue to have essentially the, the, the Bibi dynasty in place or something to the right of Bibi, I mean, it doesn't, I think it's less important what happens in the White House here. You know, members are reacting to an Israeli government that is, that is openly embracing a liberalism and is actively making common cause with the liberals around the world, including the Trump administration, right? Um, you know, if you get into a position where you have a Biden presidency trying to figure out how it doesn't clash with a with a uh, a Bibi or a Bennett government, I, I don't I don't see how that's going to move us. I, I could see it being very problematic, and I could see Congress outflanking a president on progressive values right there. I think that's going to be a real problem for a Biden presidency if he's elected. Fundamentally, I think. The most important thing here is where we started today, which is Shibley, and which is looking at where Americans are and trying to understand how those sort of um, almost subterranean shifts in the electorate are gradually going to be felt on the surface of the sea. Okay, I'm mixing my metaphors, but you get what I'm saying. Um, I, I think that is, that is less dependent on Biden. I do think it's very clear the old guard in Congress would love to see Biden in power and moving back to an Obama era pro-peace policies that they call pro-peace that they're comfortable with, which articulates comfortable, I talk about like wrapping yourself in the cloak of the two state, you know, you know, Oslo process. That that cloak is in tatters. They can wrap themselves around with it again, but but it's in tatters. Um, and and unless someone's gonna reweave it and give it some substance, it doesn't matter. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we're going to move now to our questions from the audience. Uh, I'm going to direct this first one to Peter. I, I know Peter has to leave us a little bit early, but I was hoping we can get a question into him first. Um, and this question comes from uh, Steve France, who is watching online. Uh, Peter, how much might supporters of establishing, you know, a single state with equal rights, uh, how might they advance their cause in the U.S. in this moment? 
Um, I, I mean, the, the conversation, um, once the conversation becomes legitimized in more mainstream American um, political spaces, um, and including in Jewish spaces, um, I think it will have a lot of resonance. I mean, after all, just think of we, we are, um, you know, think about the way pe what people want in the United States, right? Um, uh, we don't, we have a vision of I mean, people, progressives want essentially a secular government where everyone lives under, lives under the same law. We don't really, it would be more natural perhaps for some from people some, from other countries to perhaps think about partitioning and having kind of two ethno-religious states next side by side, but at least for progressive Americans, that's not our tradition, that's not our vision, right? So in a way, it's not a hard case to make, right? I mean, you basically just say to someone, listen, why don't we just try to make it like what we want for the United States, you know? Um, uh, it, it's um, what you have to, um, and I think that will, that will come. We, we just don't have, um, even Bernie Sanders, you know, or uh, let's say, um, hasn't been willing to actually go out and say that. He's kind of hinted at it. Um, uh, there are not a lot of politicians who kind of especially given that the Palestinian, the nominal Palestinian leadership is not taking that position. It's a little bit, in some ways, a little different to, difficult to be kind of quote, more, more Catholic than the Pope. But I do think, as it were, but I do think that if we saw a Palestinian leadership move in that direction, I think we would see more of a move in that sense. And there's, as Laura was saying, there's, there are already lots of people, as, as you all know, who say this kind of privately, right? Um, I think part of the work in the Jewish community, which I've, you know, try to do a little bit how successfully, you know, who knows, but um, is to try to, is to try to challenge the almost uh, unconscious, you know, kind of automatic move that exists among many uh, American Jews that essentially one equal state means either Jews fleeing for their lives or Jews just not even making it out with their lives, right? That it has a kind of almost genocidal connotations. You know, it, it's, it's, it's crazy in a lot of ways, but again, it, it comes from a deep trauma and it comes from a trauma that's been very effectively exploited for a very, very long time. And that's why I think it's really, really important for have us to have people coming out and talking about, um, about as you did, Yusuf, in your in your piece in, in Foreign Affairs, about how one state would work and about how one state could have protections. And then we need people who have who know something, you know, um, uh, who can actually respond to the immediate kind of vague, generalized racist responses you get. Well. There's nowhere in the Arab world where, where Jews, or for that matter, Christians could ever live safely. Look at Lebanon, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? We, you need people who can actually, have, actually enter those conversations. Most of the people who are saying those things don't actually really know very much about what's happening in the rest of the Arab world or the reason that Lebanon has evolved, right? But you need people who can enter into that conversation. I think it'll come, we're just not there yet. Thanks very much, uh, Peter. Um, our, our next question here uh, comes from uh, Melinda Smith. It's not directed to anyone in particular, but um, the, the question is, what issues and strategies, uh, legislative, protest, et cetera, uh, do you think should be prioritized for Palestinian uh, or activists for Palestinian rights? Uh, and then goes on to name some of the organizations doing that work, uh, Jewish Voices for Peace, if not now, uh, and the, the Friends Service Committee and so on. Um, anyone want to take a stab at responding to that one? I'll jump in um, just very quickly. And I think we should also mention there are Palestinian organizations. Those are basically Jewish and one Quaker ones. There's a whole range of Palestinian organizations, most notably SJP. Um, look, I think that just it, it's there's the question of defense and offense, and to some degree these are these are mixing. But um, both Zaha and I have mentioned the the battle. I would suggest that the battle going forward is as much a domestic battle as it is a battle for Palestinian rights on the ground, because those have now come together in the United States. Um, the the conflation of criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism and the effort to essentially turn that into an artifact of US law and apply it across the board is going to come back and hit everybody. I, I would be remiss to not say people need to watch this in Congress. They need to watch the targeting of social media in particular. And nobody at this weird moment in time with anti-Semitism and white supremacy and Nazism and all that surging should be downplaying the need to fight anti-Semitism. 
them. But nobody should miss the fact that there is a quiet and extremely energetic effort to wrap criticism of Israel and support for the Palestinians into that battle and essentially use it as the knockout punch to say that pretty much everything we do and say, and I say this as, as, a, as a Jew, um, is anti-Semitic and must be quashed. Um, the BDS piece as well, there are efforts now to equate personal boycotts of Israel or settlements with illegal coerced boycotts of Israel under US, which are, which are illegal under US law. There's efforts to conflate the BDS movement or support for BDS with support for terrorism right, and bring in RICO and other things. Um, the, the effort to, to weaponize um, what I call six degrees of terrorist contamination, where people say, ah, I have someone who's vaguely affiliated with the PFLP, and that means this organization many degrees away is a terrorist organization. This was the way, this was the main effort to go after McCollum for her bill um, on Palestinian children living under occupation was to argue that a highly respected human rights organization is effectively an arm of a terrorist organization because of the six degrees of contamination. So fighting for our own rights as Americans at this point has become part of the, 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 the we is interwoven with the battle for Palestinian rights writ large. Yeah, go ahead. Can I, can I jump in, Yusuf? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. I just want to I want to build on what uh, Lara said, with which I, I fully agree. Um, I think that if people want to know what they can do, there are institutions fighting these attempts to shut down the First Amendment where Israel is concerned, to limit, to, to prevent us from speaking, essentially, to say anything we say is is a violation of U.S. law, anti-discrimination law, and is anti-Semitic. You know, you're beyond the pale, you're inhuman, you're an anti-Semite, and you've broken the law and we're going to go after you with the full force of the law. There are institutions that are fighting it, this the Center for Constitutional Rights. People want to do something? Support the Center for Constitutional Rights. It is bringing legal, you, you need to bring, there are battalions of lawyers, privately funded, who are bringing meretricious, baseless cases against students, academics, organizations. The, the, the US campaign is the subject of one of these idiotic, completely baseless, meretricious, as you put it, six, degree of, uh, six degrees of separation cases. Uh, Center for Constitutional Rights is fighting, and others are fighting that. Uh, people really should pay a lot of attention to the legal aspects of this. On campus, where uh, academics and students are targeted, harassed by administrations, harassed by off-campus organizations, harassed by these battalions of lawyers, hot and cold running lawyers. God knows how much they're billing and who's paying for it. I don't even want to know. Uh, much of it seems to be directed at a distance from the Ministry of Strategic Affairs in Israel and by Israeli groups and American groups together, operating together. Uh, the, the Palestine Legal is fighting those cases. And there are other institutions besides CCR. Uh, ACLU is fighting these, uh, these cases. These are vital to our freedom of speech as Americans. It's not just a matter of Palestinian rights. I mean, if, you sh if, if they get away with this, especially in the kind of environment that Trump and the, and the, and the right wing of the Republican Party, the, the Republican Party, which is Trump's party right now, uh, have created. Um, these are incredibly dangerous for our freedoms as, as a whole, not just as, as, as far as Palestinian rights are concerned. The last thing I would say is that the efforts of groups like the Students for Justice in Palestine or Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, uh, efforts in favor of boycott, divestment, and sanctions are things that I think we should all align ourselves with and support. Um, the more people who show that they're not afraid, the, the, the greater, uh, or let me put it differently, the less intimidation that the, these people will be, these people who are trying to shut down our freedom of speech uh, will, will, will be able to exercise. I mean, the kind of thing that Lara talked about in Congress, where Congress people would close the door and say, I, you know, I'm terrified of these guys, but I really don't believe this. We're hoping that that barrier may begin to break down in Congress. They're trying to recreate that barrier in, on campus, they're trying to recreate that barrier for organizations. And I think that the more people who stand up and say, yeah, yes, we are in favor of this, and this is not anti-Semitic, uh, and, and, and we, will, we will support with our voices, with our names, with our signatures, with our, ideally with our money, um, uh, the better. 
Yeah, and um, uh, I would just add to that. Thank you for that, uh, Rashid, and thank you, Laura. I would just uh, add to that point that you know this um, this meme that we're seeing of trying to silence dissent by attacking civil society organizations, including those that are focused on human rights, is one that is proliferated across this axis of global authoritarianism. It's not, uh, of course, just limited to Israel, but uh, as recently as yesterday, we saw the news uh, that Amnesty International has been forced to shut down uh, in Modi's India, for example, because they've gone after their bank accounts and so on. So this is this is becoming sort of a, a, a device of uh, those who want to crush dissent in uh, a lot of different places. Um, and on that theme, I want to sort of uh, uh, direct this question to, to you, Rashid. You'd mentioned in, in some of your comments, uh, you know, the, the question comes from uh, David Barrett. Um, he says, I've seen a lot of commentary noting that the normalization deals don't reflect popular opinion uh, among Arab people, but isn't it also true that manifestations of protest were virtually uh, non-existent? Is it possible uh, that, uh, he writes, Saudi Emirati-dominated media culture, message control, et cetera, et cetera and thought repression uh, is genuinely increasing apathy towards the Palestinian cause? Uh, it almost feels, he says, as if uh, international solidarity is more active than Arab uh, and Islamic solidarity. So you, your reactions to that, Rashid? That, that's actually a good question. And I think there's a, there, the, the, there's a, there's a point there. Um, one of the problems is that the Arab world in general is in a parlous, terrible state. I mean, we have four countries, depending how, how, many, how you count it, Syria, uh, to some extent Iraq, Yemen, and Libya, which are in states of civil war or war. Um, and where uh, the countries have been destroyed in the case of Iraq by American invasion and sanctions, in the case of Syria by external intervention and civil war and regime repression, in the case of Yemen and Libya uh, in the wake of the 2011 uh, revolutions uh, that overthrew their, their dictatorial regimes. So four Arab countries are in a state of, they don't exist in effect, or they, they're, they're, they're very, very weak. And people are understandably obsessed with the fact that Iraq is collapsing or Syria is collapsing. If you're Syrian, uh, the last thing you can worry about is Palestine. You have a problem uh, in a, a, a third of the, of the Syrian population are still refugees inside or outside of their country. That's your biggest concern. Uh, and they are dealing with repressive regimes uh, in almost all parts of the Arab world. Yeah, the, in Kuwait, you have elections in Lebanon, you have a failing democratic system. In some other, in Tunisia, they have a real democracy. But in most Arab countries, you have extraordinarily repressive regimes, which have uh, perfected uh, the methods of keeping public opinion under control. And even in those countries that are, have lost some of that control, like the Sudan and like Algeria, you have powerful militaries supported externally by billions of dollars in the case of the Sudanese military uh, from the Gulf by these repressive monarchies that are playing the role in 2020 that St. Petersburg and Vienna played in crushing democracy in Europe in 1848. These guys are the capitals of black reaction, Riyadh and Abu Dhabi in the entire Arab world. And the regimes that are, that, that uh, the places like Algeria and Sudan where there's real contestation, um, are, are the, the military is being supported by these same regimes. And these regimes have bought up a large part, as the questioner suggests, of the Arab media. The great pan-Arab newspapers uh, are, are owned uh, by uh, 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 princes of these dynasties, using the wealth of their people to you know, buy up things. Uh, the major uh, outlets, Al Jazeera and, uh, and Al Arabiya on uh, cable TV, uh, are owned, again, uh, by Gulf potentates or by Gulf uh, interests. So uh, there is a problem in getting through. And I think there is a bit of weariness with the Palestine issue. And I think that there is an obsession, understandable obsession, with the problems that are closer to home in, in countries, uh, whether they're oil producing countries where the price of oil has collapsed and the entire economic model has failed, or whether they're countries that are facing this terrible problem of repressive regimes. Uh, so for a variety of reasons, I think there, there is no, not as much Arab support as there could be and should be. Um, but I, I think that, I think that the, again, I'll go, I'm going to go back to the polling that's done by the Arab Center. The numbers are clear. 80 something percent of people in the Arab world, according to those polls, and we're talking about thousands and thousands of people who polled in person, uh, 
uh, feel that there should not be normalization with Israel until there's a just resolution of the Palestine question. That's what the, the Arabs feel. Their, their rulers are somewhere else. Thanks so much, uh, Rashid. And I think we have time for uh, one more question here. And I want to uh, direct it to uh, Zaha. Um, do you see any way in which the uh, Palestinian leadership, the PLO, uh, could come up with a plan of its own? I think um, uh, Rashid had suggested something like this in his initial comments. Um, or a diplomatic initiative, uh, perhaps in concert with Arab governments, um, to uh, regenerate a uh, diplomatic process? Uh, this question comes to us from uh, or Orinir. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that, um, um, you know, during this Palestinian statehood bid, that was a rare moment in which, you know, you had a thought through Palestinian strategy and a, um, a plan supported by uh, different Arab governments um, to, to uh, you know, change the, you know, the um, negotiating position, but also to, to push towards accountability for Palestinians. And there was, there was a lot of energy um, around this, uh, around the statehood bid, that was between 2010 and 2012, um, both on the ground by the people internationally, um, Palestinians and solidarity groups, and, you know, in various capitals around the world. There was just, there was an amazing support and amazing um, coordination between, um, you know, Palestinian diplomats and um, the foreign ministry between different bodies within the PA, um, and that's very rare. There's a lot of dysfunction, as um, everyone might guess, <laughs> associated with um, you know, Palestinian governance, but at that moment, um, you saw a lot of cooperation, a lot of coordination, and a lot of support um, you know, by Palestinians for the initiative, even among those who, you know, were not supporters of the two-state solution. And it was because it was, you know, Palestinians showing they had agency, Palestinians, you know, pursuing um, mechanisms for accountability. So there is, there is a potential for, you know, um, for, for that kind of energy to come back again. The problem that we have, though, is, and what happened to the Palestinian statehood, but is the minute you had, um, you know, the international community and the U.S. pushing for the relaunch of talks. You know, it was like, you know, the ringing of the bell for Pavlov's dogs. Palestinians went running for that opportunity to sit at a negotiating table, even though it was clear there wasn't going to be any movement on, on negotiations with, um, you know, with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, he's tried and true in this regard. And so, you know, why, why they decided to throw away all that international go goodwill to go into negotiations, um, knowing that it was going to be completely problematic for them to, you know, to do so. And, and um, you know, it was, it's unfortunate, but, but that's the, that's the risk that's posed um, by these kind of diplomatic initiatives is, you know, that moment was lost. And there was a lot of negative feeling by members of the international community that were supporting Palestinians in the in the bid, because it was felt like um, you know uh, you're not serious when you do these initiatives. They're really just a show, and you know we also expend some political capital supporting you in your initiative. You know we also did a lot of work for you in terms of lobbying others to, to come on board. So um, again, you know that can only be successful when you have, um, you know, a national dialogue first that looks at exactly what is your objective here? You know, what, what is the purpose behind uh, this kind of international diplomatic initiative? Like, what are you, what are you trying to achieve? And um, are you in it for the long game or are you in it just for, you know, this momentary victory, you know, to bolster your own leadership? So, I mean, you know, there's a sequence to this that, that has to happen first, but is the potential there? Yeah, the, pot the potential is there, um, but it just needs to be, you know, there needs to be the Palestinians getting their house in order first. Thanks for that, uh, Zaha, and I think we're going to have to leave it there uh, for this panel. I really want to uh, 
thank you all uh, for participating, your truly incisive uh, comments and presentations, and for everybody uh, who tuned in uh, and uh, sent in their questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to uh, all of them, but there was a tremendous response. Uh, and thank you for joining uh, us for the, the third and final day of uh, Arab Center Washington, D.C.'s fifth annual conference. Um, and for uh, all the, the questions that came in over the various uh, presentations, uh, our sincere thanks to our keynote speaker today, uh, Shibli Talhamian, to uh, our uh, panel for uh, their insights. Um, thank you all, wishing you all well, and hope to see you again soon.